Hello, my name is Claire Sexton. I'm Senior Director of Scientific Programs and Outreach at the Alzheimer's Association, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today to speak about the relationship between cognitive activity and dementia. Today, we will first go through some examples of cognitive activity, then we will discuss what observational and interventional studies have shown before speculating on what possible underlying mechanisms may be. First, what is cognitive activity? Well, cognitive activity refers to engagement in mentally stimulating activities and can occur throughout the lifespan. So beginning in early life with our formal education, then in our working life, our occupation, where cognitively stimulating jobs are characterized by having the opportunity to learn new skills, to be creative, to take initiative in a fast placed environment. And then throughout life, we can engage in cognitive activity in our leisure time. This can include a host of activities from continuing education or volunteering to reading, playing musical instruments or solving puzzles. In addition, many physical and social activities also have a cognitive component to them. Let's first look at the observational literature. The evidence relating childhood education levels with reduced risk of dementia is strong. Education was included as one of 12 potentially modifiable risk factors reported in the 2020 Lancet Commission, with 7% of cases of dementia attributed to low levels of education in early life. And there's evidence to suggest that both the quantity and the quality of education may be important. For quantity, a 2020 meta-analysis calculated that each year of education reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease by 8% but it cautioned that there were inconsistencies in the definition, measurement, and operalization of education. For quality, indicators of poor school quality, such as school term length, student-teacher ratio, and attendance rates, have also been linked with dementia risk by some studies. The good news here is that globally, education levels have risen, and this has been proposed to have contributed to stable or decrease in prevalence and incidence of dementia in some countries. Next, let's consider our working lives. So somewhat surprisingly, there have been fewer studies here. However, some studies have found that cognitively stimulating jobs, for example, when you're learning new skills, is associated with a lower risk of dementia. In a study of over 100,000 participants, this relationship wasn't explained by other risk factors for dementia. Rather, the authors did link cognitive stimulation in the workplace with biomarkers in the brain, indicating there may be a direct link. If you don't have a cognitively stimulating job, is it possible for us to compensate in our leisure time? Arguably, the jury is still out regarding the benefits of leisure time cognitive activities. So on one hand, a meta-analysis of eight studies found that cognitive activity was associated with a 23% reduced risk of all-cause dementia. However, difficulty here, though, is that studies vary greatly in how they measure cognitive activity in our leisure time. As we discussed, cognitive activity can range from reading to playing an instrument to an education class. And the intensity of such activities can vary from person to person. So two people may report that they both complete a daily crossword puzzle. One person may be completing a very easy crossword, another a really taxing crossword. So there's great variation in these measures, and there's no one standard objective measurement. On the other hand, some studies with long periods of follow-up have found evidence to suggest that causality is in the opposite direction, that changes in the brain that occur with disease may reduce the risk of cognitive activity, rather than reduce levels of cognitive activity, reducing the risk for dementia. Interventional studies offer an opportunity to more directly examine cause and effect, and they fall into two main camps of intervention, cognitive training and cognitive stimulation. Cognitive training is defined as the guided practice of specific standardized tasks designed to enhance particular cognitive functions. Several systematic reviews have concluded that there is insufficient evidence to suggest that cognitive training interventions lead to an improvement in generalized cognition of clinical value. Indeed, guidelines released by the World Health Organization in 2019 on risk reduction of cognitive decline and dementia cautioned that the quality of evidence is very low to low in this field. However, 
they still did conditionally recommend that cognitive training may be offered to older adults with normal cognition and with mild cognitive impairment to reduce the risk of cognitive decline and or dementia. And this was because they weighed up that the desirable effects outweighed the undesirable. So in other words, even though benefit may be low, risk is also low. The other type of intervention focuses on cognitive stimulation therapy. And this has been described as participation in a range of activities aimed at improving cognitive and social functioning. Here, the World Health Organization guidelines did not make a recommendation, as evidence was deemed to be insufficient. There has, however, been a recent review of 37 studies that looked at benefits for people with mild to moderate dementia. And this concluded that cognitive stimulation probably leads to small benefits in cognition. And in this review, interventions were approximately 10 weeks in length, involved 20 sessions, and included discussion of past and present events, topics of interest, word games, puzzles, music, and creative practical activities. Perhaps considering the underlying mechanisms can help us understand some of these mixed findings. So firstly, why might cognitive activity be associated with reduced risk of dementia? Cognitive activity has been associated with a host of molecular, cellular, and systemic factors. And these span pathological, vascular, endocrine, immune, and metabolic processes. And such processes may serve to increase resistance, that is, protect against brain pathology. Or they may serve to increase resilience, that is, to increase the ability to withstand brain pathology and maintain overall brain integrity and cognitive function. However, the relationship between cognitive activity and dementia isn't simple, because pathways may be direct, indirect, or bidirectional. So cognitive activity may have direct benefits through some of the pathways we just discussed, or it may be beneficial through indirect pathways, so, for example, higher levels of education early in life can contribute to higher income and resources later in life. And that income and resources can help facilitate keeping physically active, a healthy diet, access to healthcare. And those factors, rather than education directly, may be what's beneficial for the brain. Finally, as we've discussed, Changes in the brain associated with dementia build up years, even decades, before the onset of symptoms. And these changes may make it less likely for an individual to engage in cognitive activity. So any relationship is likely bidirectional. All in all, the complexity of the diversity of activities that contribute to our overall level of cognitive activity, the variety of third factors at play, and the variety of possible brain mechanisms make the relationship difficult to untangle. So where does that leave us? To summarize, education, occupation, and leisure activities contribute to our levels of cognitive activity throughout life. While there is strong evidence to link early life education with reduced risk of dementia, fewer studies have examined occupational cognitive activity, and the literature regarding leisure activities is mixed. Interventional studies of cognitive training and cognitive stimulation have the potential to offer clues as to causality, but the quality of evidence to date is low. There exist a number of plausible direct, indirect and bidirectional pathways to link cognitive activity and brain structure and function. However, the diversity of cognitive activities and the possible mechanisms make it very difficult to dissect and disentangle exact mechanisms. Overall, while the evidence base for the benefits of cognitive activity is still evolving, the level of risk is often low, and many activities have other benefits too. So it's never too early or too late to find activities that we enjoy, that challenge the brain, and to start making them a regular habit. So I hope you found this overview of the relationship between cognitive activity and dementia helpful. Thank you for listening.